Everyone knows the famous Zippo. No, not for lighting your luckies, but for lighting enemy placements ablaze. In our previous video, we discussed American flamethrowers, more specifically, the man portable ones, and well, the devastating effect that they would have upon their enemy. Now imagine taking that further, and not being able to stop it without support weapons. We're talking about American mechanized flamethrowers of the Second World War. First question you might ask is why was it important to move towards mechanized flamethrowers? Unlike the European theater war, picture the theater war that a flamethrower saw the most use in, the Pacific. Here, the Japanese defense tactics employed well camouflaged positions protected by numerous machine gun emplacements. The risk to engage these positions without any extra support would be extremely high, not to mention the flamethrowers lasting a mere 8 to 10 seconds and weighing 70 pounds for a poor grunt to lug around. So, at the beginning of the war, no one could have predicted the slugfest that would have ensued over the coming years. As a result, the Allies had no mechanized flamethrowers on hand. So, the Chemical Warfare Service, or CWS for short, began a search for solutions to fill this new need. And before we dive in, I want to clarify that I will be focusing primarily on variations that saw actual use, not prototypes or testing ones, and ones that were only developed by Americans. Sorry you crocodile fans, not today. Thus came inspiration from some of our closest allies. Invented by the British, but being primarily used by the Canadians, the Ronson Flamethrower was then being mounted on the Universal Carrier. The CBs attached to the Pacific Ocean Area Chemical Warfare Service then decided to mount a number of these Ronson flamethrowers onto M3A1 light tanks. And according to the CWS, these tanks would have used compressed carbon dioxide as a repellent, they had a field capacity of 170 gallons, and a range of 40 to 80 yards depending on wind and field type used. The Ronson would replace the main gun, and result of the additional equipment for a flamethrower, turret rotation was cut down to 180 degrees. 23 of these adapted M3A1s, nicknamed Satan, would see action with Marines on Saipan and Tinian. Following these modified M3A1 successes, attempts were made to mount the M1A1 portable flamethrower onto M3A1 and M5A1 light tanks. This had very little success, and as a result, they weren't really followed through after this. As time progressed, it was quickly realized that tougher tanks would be needed to be used in the future. As by this time, Japanese Type 1 47mm anti-tank guns had already begun inflicting heavy losses on US light tanks. Now we get to the famous M4 Sherman. By this point in the war, it had already proven itself against the Axis, and with thicker armor, lent it a better mount for mechanized flamethrower. These tended to be called Zippos by troops on the ground, after the lighter that they used to light their cigarettes. There would be two main variations of mechanized flamethrowers on the Sherman, auxiliary ones, like replacing the bow gun or being mounted alongside the main gun, or a periscope mount. And secondly, one that would replace the Sherman's main gun, otherwise known as a primary mount. To start off with, we have the M4s mounted with E4-5 flamethrowers. These were mounted and connected directly to the gun. Ignition relied on gasoline electric combination. This design could be interchangeable with the bow gun. The name came from E4 being the fuel tank and E5 being the model of the flamethrower. The Sherman itself initially held 25 gallons of flamethrower fuel. This would later be increased to 50 gallons directly for the flamethrower. With a range of 49 to 60 yards, these would initially see action on Guam and later Iwo Jima. Next was the periscope mounted flamethrowers. These were designed similar to the bow guns, but is mounted by the assistant driver's hatch door or in the turn periscope mount, and a specifically designated periscope mount. The fuel was ignited by a similar gasoline electric system. These ranged 40 to 60 yards, and to my understanding, other than a few field tests, these saw no actual combat use. The first iteration of primary mounted flamethrowers was the M4 Sherman POA CWS H1. The Marines officially designated this as the M4A3R5, or more commonly referred to as the Mark I by troops on the ground. It was more specifically a Ronson variant. The name stood for Pacific Ocean Area Chemical Warfare Service Hawaii 1. Due to the upgrade being added on in Hawaii, the actual flamethrower was mounted inside a false 75mm barrel. The fuel was carried in four connected tanks containing 290 gallons of flamethrower fuel. The range was 100 to 150 yards depending on the fuel type used. These fuel tanks were located in the bottom of the vehicle on either side of the propeller shaft. The propellant used was carbon dioxide and it was carried in three 50 pound cylinders. Ignition was achieved by a gasoline jet with a standard spark plug as the igniter. The next iteration was the POA CWS H12. This particular design borrowed key elements from the Ronson as well as the Navy's Mark I flamethrower, thus providing it with more reliability. It had a range of 150 yards and it had a 300 gallon napalm reservoir. This primarily saw use on Iwo Jima. And the last generation of the war was the POA CWS H5, officially designated as the M4A3E8. This was an M4A3 with a 105mm gun and a coaxial mounted flamethrower. 
These would start being produced in the end of 1945. They would end up being used by the Marines during the Korean War. Once again, this was covering the more popular models of mechanized flamethrowers. There were several other variations that saw very little field use, such as the Navy mounting Mark I flamethrowers on LCVPs, as well as the British outfitting tanks for American use in Europe. And if you're wondering why I hardly talked about Europe, it's because there's very little need for them as they weren't as ferocious or dug in as the Japanese for the most part. That's going to wrap up another video. I just want to say thank you everyone for the support recently. I appreciate everyone that's been subscribing and leaving likes. It really does mean a lot. And I appreciate the community that we are building. I just want to say this was a hard one to make in terms of research. So in the future, I might be adding a few days to my upload schedule in order to, you know, better ensure that I can gather all the information that I need. Sorry I'm off the script here, but if anything I said was incorrect, please leave it down below. And be sure to leave a like and subscribe. And with that said, I'll catch you in the next one.